Would you read that essay mm. by Brian Doyle? Brian Doyle has been on our show before. He's a wonderful man. He's very funny. Um, and he has that Cormac McCarthy style of writing where each essay is like two or three giant run-on sentences, only Brian's in a better mood. <laughs> so. yeah. And you have to have good lungs to read Brian Doyle, yeah, too, you because do. the but sentences you, go on. You can pause at any, at I, any I'm point. I'm certainly going to do that. You know, many people approached the arguments for, for um, climate action from the point of view of the consequences of not acting. Yeah. He approached it from the consequences of who we are as human beings. Yeah. And so it's a very different and very interesting approach. It's called the Newt Note. You know, the little salamanders. Yeah. One time years ago, I was shuffling with my children through the vast, wet, moist, dripping, enormous, thicketed, webbed, muddy, epic forest on the Oregon coast, which is a forest from a million years ago, the forest that hatched the biggest creatures that ever lived on this bruised, blessed earth. All due respect to California and its redwood trees, but our cedars and firs make them redwoods look like toothpicks. And my kids and I were in a biggest creature mood because we had found slugs way longer than bananas and footprints of elk that must have been gobbling steroids. And a friend had just told us of finding a bear print the size of a dinner plate. And all of us had seen whales in the sea that very morning. And all of us had seen pelicans too, which look like flying pup tents. And how do they know to all hit cruise control at the same time? Does the leader give a hand signal? As my son said, and one of us had seen the two ginormous young eagles who live somewhere in this forest. So when we found the biggest stump in the history of the world, as my daughter called it, we were not exactly surprised. It was basically totally understandable that suddenly there would be a stump so enormous that it was like someone had dropped a dance floor into the forest. That's the sort of thing that happens in this forest. And my kids, of course, immediately leaped up on it and started shaking their groove things and dancing themselves silly. And I was snorting with laughter and well, until one kid, the goofiest, why we did not name this kid Goofy when we had the chance in those first few dewy minutes of life, I will never know. Well. This kid, of course, shimmed over to the edge and fell off head over tea kettle, vanishing into a mat of fern nearly as tall as me. But the reason I tell you this story is that while we were all down in the moist velvet dark of the roots of the ferns, trying to be solicitous about Goofy and see if he was busted anywhere serious, but also trying not to laugh and whisper the word doofus, <laughs> one of us found a newt. Oh my God, Dad, check it out. Of course, the newt, rattled at the attention, peed on the kid who held it. And of course that led to screeching and hilarity. And of course on the way home, we saw damselflies mating, which also led to screeching and hilarity. But the point of this story isn't pee or lust, however excellent a story about pee or lust would be. It's that one day when my kids and I were shuffling through the vast, wet, moist forest, we saw so many wonders and miracles that not one of us ever forgot any of the wonders and miracles we saw, even though we saw only tiny shreds and shards of the ones that are there. And what kind of greedy, criminal, thug thieves would we be as a people and a species if we didn't spend every iota of our cash and creativity to protect and preserve a world in which kids wander around gaping in wonder and hoping nothing else rubbery and astonishing will pee on them? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Thank you, Brian. Yeah, what kind of greedy, criminal, thug thieves would we be? I would hate to be a thug thief. <laughs>